So being the last speaker of the day is an honor, um, but also something daunting was everybody before me gave awesome talks about the future of Rust and how they use their tools uh, to the benefit of the community. And this is not that talk. Um, this also isn't a talk about the turbo fish, although that's interesting in itself and you should look into that because it's a beneficial tool to use. Now for me, um, I like to use um, programming language uh, such as REST to uh, explore IVs or explore myself. Uh, and, and this is one of what I wanted to do with you. Um, so basically this talk came out of a workshop where we looked at the, uh, uh, this image. Does anybody know this image? Some people know, yes, this is Asher. Um, if you don't know this image, uh, you're one of the lucky 10,000 of the day because uh, he's a lovely artist. He's, he's Dutch, uh, was Dutch, he's, he's deceased now, uh, and he made uh, beautiful art. Uh, he's a graphic artist, uh, and one of his most famous works uh, explore uh, the ideas of infinity and, and uh, impossibility. Uh, and uh, if you don't know it, you're probably going to love it. Um, and this is a beautiful image uh, that alludes to that sense of infinity, and probably you all will recognize some form of recursion. And um, if you look at the work of uh, Escher, you could might imagine that he's some kind of a mathematical genius, but he wasn't. He was just very talented and worked on his concepts of nature. And uh, he was very much inspired by the Italian landscape and his earlier work, you can see reflected in that. So what I wanna do with you today is to recreate this. So buckle up, because um, we're gonna do that in a um, quick way. So I'm not claiming to be as talented as Escher is or was, um, but I know a, a trick and I'm gonna explain it to you. So let's look at the Rust logo um, and try to copy that, uh, which is a problem nowadays, I guess, but we'll <laughs> sort it out later. One way of doing that is by overlaying an image that you want to copy with the grid. And if you copy that grid, then you have a, a smaller task you can focus on. So for example, if we would copy the Rust logo and uh, fill out the cell by cell, I would do the first one, uh, that's the left most upper part cell, and then I'll quickly finish, then somebody else could fill in another part. So she has a little bit of work to do. And if everybody does its task, then at the end, uh, in a slow process, the entire logo uh, is copied. So this is called the painter's uh, method. And it basically is an algorithm to um, copy an image that you already have. Um, but the interesting thing is, is that you can change the grid. So if I squish the grid and instruct you to still copy each cell into the corresponding cell, um, you have a different image, which is squished. Or if you maybe shear it or rotate it, um, if you still, as an artist, do your job of copying over your cell into your designated cell, uh, we're winning. Um, and this idea is central to what we're going to do. So what I like to do when having this concept of a, of a painter's algorithm is to uh, create abstractions that allow me to express that secondly. So one of the abstractions I'm gonna uh, talk about is uh, a box. So this is a box, uh, it has three arrows, vectors, mathematical vectors, not the vectors you put stuff in. Um, and uh, the first one, uh, read in this image, um, points where the origin of the box is. So this way you can manipulate the image by changing the origin. And the other two vectors basically say how the x axis and the y axis will change. So you can um, change the way the, the box is squished. Um, so this is my implementation of that concept. Uh, it uses mathematical vectors. We're not going into the definition of those. Uh, you can assume they are provided by some sort of crate. So because um, the IDs are mathematical, I'm using single letter uh, names so we can use them all in. So A is the origin. You can change that to place an image in a position that you want. And the B vector is the, the X axis. But although if you can change that, you can also point up uh, and the C is the y-axis of the corresponding box. Is that clear? So probably this is the most hard, uh, the difficultest co uh, concept in this talk. So if you, if you grasp this, you're well on your way onto recreating uh, the famous image of Escher. So my name is Dan. Um, this is the letter D. Uh, quite incidentally, it's a beautiful letter, not only because it's the first letter of my name, but also it has no symmetry uh, symmetries. So if you flip it over, it will become a P. Uh, if you Mirror it the other way, it's going to be a Q or some other letter that I can't pronounce. 
Um, and we can use this to build up a language source of how we can manipulate uh, um, uh, pictures, basically. So one thing that I want, what I would like to do is to uh, uh, turn it over. So it becomes a little of this. And what we're going to do is not figure out to draw the D. What we're going to do is we're going to figure out how to create a box from a given box that changes the letter. Is that concept here? So I'm, I'm giving you a box that is the, the, the box you have to draw into, and you will give me another box that will flip the image that I'm drawing into. Does that make sense? So this is the original box on the left side, and what I want to produce is a new box that has flipped the image. So what I have to do is I have to reorder, re re align the origin, uh, so the red arrow has to change, and I have to reorder the axis so that the image will be flipped. Does that make sense? So if you look at the screen and you tilt your head, the image looks somewhat the same. The only difference is that the red arrow has changed. But if you know a little bit of math and have studied vector algebra, you will notice that it is the sum of the original A, the origin of the original box, and, this, uh, and the B, the x-axis of the original box. So if you sit down on your computer and translate this concept into a function that will accept a box and returns a box that is flipping the image, it would look something like this. And here again, the API of all those vectors is provided in a crate, um, so you have, don't have to really worry about it. But this is basically uh, the task that we're now presenting to you. Given a box, produce a new box that changes the image in a way. Is that, does that make sense? Okay. So if I would ask you to make a B, you can still figure out a way to create a box that will flip the image all the way around. Does anyone want to venture a guess? Okay. Um, so again, if you have an original box, you need to create an image that will flip the other way around. Uh, the origin still has to move in a certain direction. Um, it's the same as the previous image. Um, and now the axes are changed a little bit differently. Um, um, but basically, uh, you need to negate one and uh, keep the other. And this is the implementation. What I haven't told you is how these boxes are used. So if you look how flip box is used to create an image, uh, and, and the, the images in these algorithms are SVGs, basically, um, we're going to look at that now. So this is the implementation of how the flip box is used. If you look into the, the method body, um, Specifically, the, the most important to rules is I will get a flipped box and I will apply that flip box uh, or will give that flip box to the painter, basically, or the picture. And what is a picture? Well, basically, a picture is a function, uh, in a sense, that accepts a box um, and that produces a rendering. So what is a rendering? Well, uh, a rendering is nothing more than an actual vector, a vec of things to draw, shapes, those are lines, um, maybe polylines or polygons, with some styles, how, how thick should I draw that line? Uh, and a number of those. So an image or an SVG basically is nothing more than a list of things that you need to draw. And what a picture is, is a function that accepts a box. You can see that as the canvas that you're allowed to draw on uh, and can draw some specific shapes. Does that make sense? Some people at least are nodding. So I will take that as granted. Um, and this concept, like having a function um, that will accept a box and will give some shapes, is the central V. And because this is Rust, you have to fiddle a bit, or at least I have to fiddle a bit, with having a, a reference counter. Because the, the picture or the painter needs to be passed around. And I don't want to worry about um, lifetimes, because um, sometimes there are pain. Um, but will will that will bite me in my ass later on. But basically, this is the the concept: is a picture is nothing more than asking a painter to draw something inside of a box. Okay. This is a toss. So basically, if I just flip the image or turn the image around, this is throwing it up in the air, um, and you can figure out um, a way to express that in boxes. Uh, again, the original box is on the left, and the new tossed uh, box should be this. And you can figure out that the relation between the x's is a bit obscure, 
but if you uh, have a keen eye, you will see that the yellow r right arrow ends at the sum of those uh, yellow and uh, purple ar arrows uh, at the beginning. Uh, and if you do the math, um, you have to add them together or subtract them and halve them. Um, but, but that's not really the most interesting thing. Now I see some of you worrying that is he going to talk the rest of the talk about these boxes because that, not re this, that isn't really interesting. Uh, and no, I'm not going to do that. Um, in fact, the next concept that we need um, uh, is placing two boxes on top of each other. And because the code to do that uses helper functions, it doesn't fit on the slides. So I'm not going to show you that. Um, but I want you to focus on the concept. So like, if I would ask you to come up with a way to, if I give you a box, produce an image that um, has two boxes in it, you can probably figure that out. Like, OK, maybe I'm going to have a helper function that subdivides a single box with some fraction. And then maybe I need to shift the first and the last and give a topple back of those two boxes. And that's exactly right. And that's boring, because that's, those are boxes. And um, I lost connection with. Um, and, and that's exactly the way you should do it. And um, this, you could do the same thing with putting images next to each other. Um, you will create a function that creates boxes and puts them, that puts them next to each other, and that allows you to uh, express images that way. Is that clear? Great. So basically, what I'm telling you is that those boxes are helpful to explore the idea of creating images by expressing that in a higher order language. But these boxes, they're almost done now. Um, because if you want to express this image, um, and you know that you have uh, a, a basically a function that allows you to place images above each other, because that's the underlying concept that we just had. We, we show the boxes, but there is also a function, basically, that takes a, a, a picture, and or two pictures, basically, and puts them above each other. How would you express this? I have some time, so no worries. What, what was the? Yes, so you could would co compose those two splits. So if, if you have a f function that expresses, that accepts two pictures, then you can say, well, put this one above that one. And you have four of those, um, basically a quartet, that accepts four pictures. Then you can use those first two to maybe have set them aside uh, ne next to each other and the entire image above each other. And that's exactly the same thing. So the implementation, forget about the f signature, the implementation is nothing but put above each other the things that you need to be, be beside each other. So we have a picture northwest, northeast, southwest, and southeast, and you have to place next to each other, uh, besides each other, um, both north images and besides each other, both south images, and uh, put those resulting images above each other. And this is magical, right? If, you, if you're still awake, and you would think about what we're doing is we're expressing how to make a collage of pictures. And there's only, well, m maybe one line if you have a code former that doesn't like intonation like this. Um, and that's, that's very powerful. And this is the power of expression. Like if you have the, the right abstraction that allows you to express yourself sucking um, in a, li a little amount of code. Again. Um, if you have helper functions that allow you to place things beside each other with different ratios, um, then you can use that to express this image, the known at. And um, if you think back about the square limit, um, that will allow you to maybe see if you think in your mind's eye that there's a roster that will allow you to express this. So again, I would ask the same questions. How would you express and code this way? And you will use those prim those, these primitives to basically certainly express how to combine nine images into a grid. And it looks like this. There are columns, and the columns have rows in them, and those rows are what you see here. It's not very scary, is it? And I've, I, hi I hid the, 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 the signature. But this is quite understandable. If I, if I told you, here are nine painters, 
um, let them paint in a, in a grid, basically, then the instruction will be very uh, clear. Like you need to have a column of rows of things. Does it make sense? Great. Because uh, it doesn't really take that much longer to express the uh, square limit of Escher in this way. Because the only thing that we need is one way to uh, overlay things. Um, but basically, if you think back about the interface, what a rendering is, is nothing more than a, uh, a bunch of things that you want to draw. So if you have a painter that can paint a D, and you have a painter that can paint a tossed D, then you just ask to paint them on the same canvas, and you're done. So basically, it is just adding the results of those paintings, painters, uh, to, a, to a resulting vector. This is a fish. Now it gets interesting, right? Um, I'm going to tell you how to draw a fish, uh, but it's a bit like drawing an owl. Um, <laughs> so this fish, this is the real cross, uh, craft work. Like um, It has stylus lines that allows you to see a fish, but it also has a lot of symmetries, and you will see later on that they will fit in, in, uh, interlock into each other in a marvelous way. So this is the real artist, ar artistry, uh, and I'm just handing you the result of that artistry. I, I haven't figured this out myself. Um, uh, this is was given to me as well, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So you're going to draw a fish, um, and the fish is the thing. But what we're going to do is we're going to create tiles. And this tile, um, you will see, notice the, the big fish present, but also there's some little fishes. Um, so the things that we're building up to is a, a language that and can express these things. So what are the ingredients that are used uh, in creating this picture? Does anybody want to venture a guess? I actually have a mic ready here. Yeah, so one man, some, somebody mentioned that. Maybe you can say it again. Uh, the, the two little fishes are the same big one mirrored and then rotated at different angles. Yes. So, so uh, there's another suggestion. Uh, yeah, I was going to also say that you're probably going to tile this uh, to make, uh, yeah, some kind of Escher like. Yes. So uh, you can see here the, the tile that you're going to use to create the infinite pattern. That's exactly correct. So, in fact, there's the big fish that's already given. It's overlaid with uh, two little fishes. And the little fish basically is a toss up of a big fish and flipped around. And then the, the last little fish. If you turn around enough times the, the fish that you have tossed and flipped, it will get the other fish. So um, expressed in code is not that complicated. So you have the big fish, um, you have the top fish that basically is a flipped fish that you had tossed, and you have the other fish, which is basically uh, a, count, a, a clockwise turn, or if you turn three times uh, that image, uh, and you overlay all those things. So if you have the right primitives, expressing this image isn't that hard. You have to think about it, and if you do this uh, yourself, you have to fiddle a bit because you, you will see, ah, there is some sort of relationship, I need to turn this a bit, um, but eventually we'll get this. And this is, this, isn't, this isn't really complex code. Everybody in this room probably could have written this code, at least um, if you're guided by a great teacher like me. Um, for the next question, there's not a towel. Um, uh, I will spoil it a little bit. There is a toss in there. Uh, and probably everybody can see that if you have one fish and you turn it around enough times, you'll get the other fish, right? So again, uh, this is a tile that's probably going to be used in the uh, uh, end image, um, but it's not that complicated to describe if you have a fish. So if you flip and toss a uh, fish um, and you combine that with a, a turn and you turn the entire thing upside down, so basically if you have the top image or the top and the left one, if you turn it twice, uh, you get the other part. And this is the beauty of the fish. Like, if you would have drawn a random fish, which you probably could, it wouldn't have those nice properties that the fins have right angles that fit together nicely, or the other one. So, so this is the real image, uh, artistry of the image, of the fish. Does that make sense? OK, we're almost there. So this is the side of the square limit of Escher. And um, if you look closely, you might see that it is subdivided into a square. And if you look at the um, 
What's that? The bottom right square. You see one of the tiles just described. So that's awesome. We know that we can use that to express that image. And if you look at the bottom left side and you tilt your head, then you will see the same image you just saw. Um, so those are the two basic instruments, uh, instruments. And then if you have good eyes and you will zoom in to the top right square, uh, basically it's the same image, only um, smaller. So you're probably all familiar with recursion, uh, and this is also what's used here. Um, if you allow yourself to uh, have faith and, and know that the bottom two are clear and that the top two are just uh, recursive images of, of the, what you're working on, then that allows you to express this in code. And, and there's only one problem, because um, I've chosen well, and I, I've, I've picked an abstraction that goes against the grain of Rust, and it has something to do with lifetimes and uh, uh, the function type that gets interpreted in a specific way. So if you were working in an, a functional language, for example, JavaScript, that would have a different um, feel to it, because what ha basically happens now is that we have the recursion inside of the painter algorithm, and we need to explicitly call a box and then apply that box to the image. Whereas if you were have, have maybe a less strict um, type system, you will be easier expressing this as just returning a function of the same type. Because the problem is that the, the, if, um, the if part, uh, the, if, 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 the if statement, uh, the, uh, the, the first block has a different type than the second block if you do the functional type, or at least in my implementation, probably somewhere here could tell me how it should have done that. Uh, please talk to me. But basically, if you have a parameter n that is zero, you just don't paint anything. Uh, and if you have a parameter n that is bigger than zero, you basically take the tile that you just uh, described, uh, turn it over, and place that in the quartet that we worked on. Make sense? That's basically the structure. It is. And this already is a complex image, but the implementation isn't that hard. So this is a corner. Um, we're going to stitch those together uh, in a little while. Um, what we see here, uh, again, if you squint your eyes a bit, you can notice a grid. And in the bottom right corner of that grid, there's the, the towel that we saw earlier of the four fishes next to each other. And if you remember and have a visual memory, you will notice that the uh, upper right image basically is a, a side, right? It's just the same image as we had before. Uh, and if you tilt your head, then the, and you untilt your head again, the lower left image is the same side only tilted. And again, we're going to use recursion here because the upper left one is just the same thing that we're drawing, only one stage uh, deeper. Does that make sense? So again, uh, there's not a lot of code, and it's already a complex image. Uh, and what we're left is just assembling those things. And what we've done along the way is we expressed those primitives in a way that they are easily combined to form this image. Because if you squint your eyes again, you might notice that there is a grid. Um, and this is the grid that we already created, the no-net that we created. At the center is the tile that we described, so that was the simple one. Um, in the upper middle part of the grid, you will see that there is a side, and if you turn your head enough times, you will see them four times around. And again, if you look at the upper right, there's a tile um, that we've seen before, and if you turn your head again, uh, again, you will see that those are copies of that. So basically, there are three ingredients. The center, which is a tile that we described, there are the sides um, and the corners, and if you turn the right things the right amount of times, you have the entire, entire image. And this is the code to create that image. And again, um, Rust is fighting the abstraction here, um, but this is basically what the square limit of Azure is. Um, there are some primitives that you allow you to express that the code is nothing more than a no-net of nine different pictures, and each picture in itself has a primitive tile that is turned around a couple of times and stitched together. Does that make sense? Great. So I didn't come up with this. Um, this these IVs come from a paper called Functional Geometry by Peter Henderson. He wrote that paper in the 
1982, and you revised it uh, 20 years later, when it was 2002. Those, these ideas are old, in a sense. What the, these allude to is that if you can express the concepts that you're working with um, in, an, in a way that allows you to combine them, you have a very powerful mechanism for uh, describing complex programs in a simple way. Uh, although far less visual than uh, the, the uh, instructions that I gave you, uh, these concepts, for example, you can find them in partial combinators. Uh, it's the exact same concept. And what you invited to do is um, explore this paper, because it's a very nice paper. And if you want to explore these ideas yourself, there's also a workshop, um, a self-guided workshop, that you can do, which you can do each step individually, guided by that work. So I would like to um, explain to you why I'm doing this. Because uh, I did a workshop like this um, by Einar Host. He is a um, Norwegian software developer that is fond of this concept and um, can stop talking about fishes. And uh, a few years back, I was at a conference where he gave this workshop uh, in Elm, which is also a lovely language. And I was a model by this ID, and I created the workshop in Rust, um, um, which, is, which this talk is based upon. And last March, uh, I went to a different conference, and I saw him again, and he gave the same workshop in a different language. And uh, I attended, because it's a lovely concept. And we s started talking that um, the circle limit of Escher, which is also a beautiful work, um, you can't apply the same ideas to this image. And I, I didn't agree with him, because the idea is you have to combine uh, simple abstractions into complex things. You can still do this for this image, but, but it's a bit different. And we challenged each other to come up with uh, a way to express this image um, in code as well. So maybe next year, if there is a next year, um, I'm going to talk about that result. So thank you. Thank you, Dan. Who's got questions about fishes or functional geometry? Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so the last time I threw the box that far, it broke. So why uh, was there a suggestion that this one is not uh, reproducible in such manner? So if you look at the, uh, the end result of the circle limit, uh, it basically is on the flat plane. Um, and uh, if you have an image and you shrink it a little bit and you sh shift it around on the plane, you can assemble those uh, and uh, stitch them together into this image. Whereas the, um, the circle limit uh, is, takes place on the hyperbolic plane. Um, and that is a, a different concept. So um, I'm actually creating code to re-express re this. Uh, and what you have to think about is, well, this new geometry in the hyperbolic plane, whatever that means, how can you apply the same with days of the functional geometry in that setting? Uh, yeah, there's still a question. Yeah, so the, the suggestion is, can't you express those in, in matrices? Yes, in a way, you're right. You can express some of the transformations as matrices, but there are matrices uh, on the complex plane. But maybe that's a bit too technical to shout out over an audience. If you want to discuss that, just uh, come around and we'll talk about it. Other questions or suggestions? There are a few. Oh, there. Oh, fun. Yeah. Okay, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> could you go back for a second uh, to the slide about the toss? About which one? Uh, the um, rotated box. Oh, I the rotated box. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, it was, yeah, in the beginning. Yeah, here. This one? Uh, no, not this one. Um, this one. No, <laughs> I think it was also at an angle. Okay, the toss one. The toss one, yeah. Yeah, sure. 
This one. Yes, yeah. indeed. So um, I actually wanted to ask, this is essentially just a rotation from what I see? Yes. Um, and you mentioned that you also scale it by a half. Yeah. Why do you do that scaling? I mean, yeah. I do get it for the end result, but I, yeah. Yeah, so that, the basic answer is uh, the fish that you saw um, has properties that fit nicely with this toss. So if you uh, see this fish, uh, this fish, and, and you toss and flip it, then it will align nicely. Uh, I see. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, there were still another question. Does it work? Yeah, yeah, so the box is there, so you'll get it afterwards. Nice. Uh, so thanks for a nice presentation. It does look like a fun um, thing to do, especially with multiple programming languages. But looking at the snippet, I have to wonder if Rust might be particularly unsuitable for it. You had to wrap everything in reference counting. You had to add a lot of type annotations, um, tra traits, and so on. Yes. It probably would have been much easier to use a different language. So I wonder if there were also benefits, or if you just wanted to use Rust because you wanted to use Rust. Um, yeah, you're entirely right. So, so I don't think Rust is, uh, uh, or at least my Rust powers are a nice fit for expressing these ideas. Um, but I, what I wanted to do was challenge myself: Can I express those? And um, like, challenge yourself to do to do a task and see where Rust will lead you is an interesting exercise in itself. But you're right. Uh, at least to my knowledge, um, at the moment that I created the workshop, uh, expressing those ideas was a bit ugly. Like the the signature type. Um, with a lot of different images um, isn't very fun to see. And, and that's, uh, to my understanding, is because um, these are, their functional types are, are different because all, the, all, the, all they look the same. Um, but if anybody has ideas to express this more singularly, that would be interesting as well. So I don't think, you can't say that Rust is a functional language, uh, but it has some functional aspects that will re relate to this as well. Yeah. Thanks. Does that answer your question? So just one question about the circle limit. Is it like the, so it's on the hyperbolic plane, so the straight lines are not straight lines, I guess, but is it an exact, is the reprojection of the square limit on the hyperbolic plane? Or no. Or is it different? It's different. So um, the fishes here are, are fishes as well, uh, and they share that, but the relation between the fishes is different. So, um, and I can understand where you're coming from, uh, that the, the straight lines aren't straight lines, but in the hyperbolic plane they are straight, but this representation... Exactly, uh, reprojection again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but but the, the symmetries of the fish basically uh, are different than the, the symmetry of the fishes uh, in the square limit. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just a suggestion about uh, you were mentioning the, uh, how to express this in Rust. Uh, have, have you, uh, when you were implementing this, have you uh, looked into uh, rather writing multiple types and attaching methods on those types and having each method return a different type the way, in a way you can chain it, like in an iterator-like way where, uh, with adapters and things like that? Yes, I, I haven't done it in Rust, but there, like the, the concept, basically the concept is you, you want something that combines nicely um, so that you can express these complexities with simple mechanisms. And there are multiple ways to do this. You can do this in Python, which also has functions, but you can also do just classes that then will have an, a, a, like a, a class, um, ob w a, a tree of classes that have as r responsibilities of drawing objects. So there are various ways to do this. And the interesting is that, these, th that the ID can be applied to different languages and different language models. So I haven't th done that in Rust. I haven't done that in other languages. Uh, but it will be interesting to explore your idea. Yeah. Anyone, Anyone else? <laughs> Where? <laughs> yeah, I wondered, did you ever try to do the reverse? So uh, set up the, um, uh, an empty image with repetitions and draw on it so you can figure out, okay, this is a nice shape to create a fish or an owl or whatever? Um, I, I haven't, but there are people, uh, especially for the, the, the regular plane, the flat plane, uh, that do this. There's a, 
um, I will tweet a link to a uh, project that does exactly this. So it allows you to um, take uh, a symmetry of the plane, so that will tile uh, an image, and then it allows you to draw uh, things on your tile, and then it gets repeated, which is uh, which is exactly your idea. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. All right. That's looks like no more questions. Thank you, Dan.